All right, let's get this going. Uh, Robert Toomey is an artist exploring the intersection of machine perception and human desire. He received his, his BS from Yale University with majors in art and biomedical engineering. Seriously? <laughs> God, you didn't party much in college, did you? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then he didn't stop, so he, then he got his MFA <laughs> in visual arts from the University of California, San Diego, and is currently a PhD candidate in the DX Arts program at the University of Washington. Wow, that's a lot of school. <laughs> I'm super excited for this. This is going to be great. Uh, I told you I wasn't going to ask you to applause anymore, but I lied to you. I'm going to ask you one more time. A big warm welcome for Robert Toomey. Thank you. Can you all uh, hear me all right out there? So. Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, David uh, int introduced me. Well, first off, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, yeah, I was really excited uh, when I met with David to hear about the topic for this week's Creative Mornings. Um, as he said, I'm an artist in this uh, PhD program at UW, um, you know, digital arts and experimental media. So I spend a lot of time working with many of the technologies that might, um, you know, be a part of a robot, like the mechatronics, the sensing, um, you know, and it, all kinds of stuff. But I'm not accustomed to thinking of my work through this lens of robotics. Um, however, like many of you probably, you know, robots were an object of childhood fascination for me. Um, as someone with like a proclivity for electronics and tinkering um, and a real appetite for science fiction, you know, robots were kind of this pinnacle form, form of technology. Um, using the same kind of guts is the things that I would build, but infinitely more capable. In Isaac Asimov's robot books, you know, robots operate interchangeably with humans. Um, governed by their, you know, positronic brains, they wrestled with their behavioral codes, you know, Asimov's three laws, moral quandaries, and in the process of their struggles and their interactions with people, we get some deeper reflection on our own humanity. Um, the closest I got to building a robot growing up is this, um, were these instructions from Boy's Life in 1987. Um, <laughs> I'll say, I don't know if it was out of my skill level or what, but um, you know, I, the project never quite got finished. Um, but I learned something about you know, ordering uh, industrial motors through the mail, uh, DC power supplies, terminal blocks, and uh, creative uses of trash cans and gardening supplies. Um, but there are many, so there are many threads, threads in here in this childhood fascination with robots um, as these hybrid objects of fiction and engineered reality that continue in my work today. So uh, bear with me with just a little more intro and then we'll kind of get into the, the, the work that I do. Um, and have done, but uh, so the word robot was coined by the Czech writer um, Karel Čepek in, in this 1920 play called Rossum's Universal Robots. Um, interesting that this topic came from the, the Prague chapter, right, of Creative Mornings. So, um, so, but the term comes from the Czech word robota, which means forced, forced work or slavery or drudgery. Um, we have something, you know, we have something of a flourishing in contemporary robotics, uh, you know, through like the DARPA grand challenges. We're seeing, you know, Boston Dynamics, like Atlas Robot, you know, Big Dog Robots. So we see these, you know, we're kind of familiar with robots as this ensemble of, of technologies, like depth cameras, actuators, um, kind of these sort of sinister military forms. Um, but the strongest connection to what I do is through this idea of the robot as a surrogate or a substitute. And I think that's in there in this idea of the word coming from, you know, the, work, the word work or the word labor. So, so a robot is a surrogate or a substitute, a doppelganger, a technological other. Um, you know, the definition of the robot is a thing that works or labors in place of the human. That's kind of where the thread of my creative work picks up. Um, I, like to, I try to work with technology in a way that um, 
as a way to think about human labor, about human relationships, emotions, desires. So in my projects, machines act in place of humans. Sometimes humans act in place of machines, and we learn something about each. So it's a kind of reciprocal diagnosis or analysis. You know, what are the capabilities afforded by new technologies? What are their limitations? How do we see ourselves and understand ourselves differently through them? So um, as, as David mentioned, I, I, uh, you know, I came to art as a painter. I'd always, like my whole life, I've always done drawing and painting. And, um, and for a long time, that was kind of my primary art practice, like going into a, you know, my MFA program. Um, but there's this history of surrogates in my work, so this idea of the surrogate. And uh, this, this slide and the next one are showing images from this project I did in 2007. So it was called the Father-Daughter Art Show. Um, but basically, it was, an, it was a whole project built around the idea of an imaginary daughter. So this idea of a surrogate, a totally like, non-technological surrogate, but through this fiction of a daughter that didn't exist. I mean, I was like, you know, 20 something living in my studio on campus. It was like not, <laughs> and there was no parenting happening. But, but, but using this uh, surrogate and this imagined other as a way to explore identity, you know, dynamics of the family, um, ideas of parenting, you know, familial parental love. Um, and then also it was like an exercise in pure fantasy. So you see like we have, um, like these are portraits of, of girls that were up for adoption in California at that point. There's this thread of like embodiment, you know, thinking about these, it actually, the whole project started with these, I saw these children's boots at the, um, you know, Goodwill in uh, San Diego and saw this children's bed and I was like, oh, I wonder, you know, what, how large would a child be, you know, that would be standing in these. Um, and then the whole idea of like as a, you know, male artist in his mid twenties taking on a project about parenting or childhood, like had this really nice um, kind of entanglement of my identity my production of the work with, you know, what was being made. Um, anyway, so uh, kind of the first example of a surrogate in my artwork. But I think this issue of human substitute or surrogate becomes more interesting when we're dealing with technologies. Then we switch from like, you know, so the passive object or the, you know, the static art objects to them on the wall to active or responsive, you know, embodied systems. So. This, um, this is kind of the first successful, I would say successful piece of um, you know, tech art or computer art that I've made. But basically, um, it's called MegaHAL Grandmommy. And I don't know if people have heard, MegaHAL is like this chatbot software. So have people used chatbots or talked to chatbots before? Um, the famous one is called Eliza, and it was like a, a therapist. You know, so people would sit down. This is like this, the whole idea of the Turing test and you know, can a software persuade you that it's human, um, you know, comes from, this is kind of the same line of thought. But basically, so a chatbot is um, a simple interactive text system where, um, excuse me, sorry, where we, uh, you know, where you, where the, whoever's like talking to it, you know, sits and types and the thing talks back. But so anyway, so, so I got to grad school, I've been doing painting, I was tired with like the indirectness of painting, the fact that you have to always make an image of something instead of actually doing that thing. Like if you're interested in say computer programming or something, you can like make a painting about programming as opposed to like working immediately with the medium. Um, so I'm learning about, you know, computer art, net art, and, um, and these chatbots, and at the same time my grandmother is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And the, the thing with these chatbots is that that for the most part, they make absolutely no sense. Like they have these like moments of levity or humor, you know, they say something, something pops up that like kind of works. And for a second, the fiction of like, yes, there's like, you know, a soul in the machine or like someone on the other end of the line, you know, for a second it works and then it disappears again. Um, and what I liked is this idea that the dysfunction of the system could be descriptive of something like my grandmother's, you know, Alzheimer's. So. So I trained, um, the chatbot I chose was um, one that would kind of learn from the conversations you would have with it. So I primed it with some basic information, like my grandmother's name is Jean, you know, some facts, some people in the family, you know, names of people in the family and some of the kind of the events surrounding her recent situation. Um, and then spent, like over the course of a number of months, I would just talk to this thing at night, like type to it, have this sort of personal interaction with it as a way to reflect on the situation. Um, also to build this sort of strange, you know, unique portrait of my grandmother um, at this point. So, um, so this, this is kind of the first, first time when I've made 
like a, you know, a technical surrogate um, in interacting with it. So when I would show this for people, you know, we'd set up, uh, you know, there'd be this computer running, people could come, come up and talk to it, and basically through these little narrative clues and kind of what it knew or what it said, you know, they'd start to get this piece together, this sense of a narrative, and, um, and we get this layering of like, this fiction of the grandmother, the way I was talking about it, you know, and so on. Um, so anyway, so, so I, applied to, I applied to, you know, I moved to Seattle with this proposal for a program to, to examine this intersection of like human and machine perception. I'm like, okay, I'm into like computer vision and speech recognition and all these kinds of things, but you know, specifically where, where do these technologies meet up with, you know, our like human stories, our human needs, all the kind of like messy, you know, reality of, of being a person in the world with a body. Um, so the next few projects I'll show you are kind of, they're less like robots explicitly, but they sort of, they have some, they're kind of like some of the component systems of what you might have in, in a robotic system. Um, so this project is called Solipsist, um, and, and basically was, was a project built around the idea, it's, it's kind of an, it's an intelligent receipt printer, you know, intelligent. So, but basically, um, you know, I was working with an open source uh, speech recognition technology and exploring this idea of language as a closed system. I mean, the thing with like when you're talking to Siri or Cortana or Google Now, um, you know, the, the, the thing is that the space of what it can understand and so the space of what you can say is limited in some sense by the model, like the model that it's trained on. Um, working with an open source package, I could actually control the model that this system was running and I primed it with all this text and, and stuff that I'd written over the past couple of years. Um, this is where the title Solipsist comes from a little bit. So basically, everything, you know, a viewer comes and, you know, you can come and talk to this and it's basically printing out, you know, it's printing out a little transcript of what it hears. Um, everything you can say, it's gonna hear in terms of the words that I put in there. And I think this maybe points towards um, the problem with language generally, which is that like, you know, there's only so much you can say with words that language is maybe, in some ways it's finite, in some ways it's not, you know, but um, getting to like the issue of language. Um, yeah, so solipsist, um, the, <laughs> the next, keeping this thread going, so from machines that hear to machines that see, um, this project, uh, face swap, I was using, um, you know, just some computer vision. It, it started with an earlier project um, where I was taking photos of, for me, like, art world heroes, things like that, and doing some basic face recognition. And the idea was, again, it's kind of dealing with the closed system of a database or a model, but saying that, um, you know, everyone, everyone it sees, it sees everyone in front of it in terms of kind of the people it knows. So this, this project has, um, I'll just let this video run in the background here. Sometimes going the way of cancer. So we'll see, you'll see me, me interacting with this, but basically, um, and I'll talk over top of it. You'll see Joseph Boys uh, popping up there in a second. Marina Abramovic will, will show up. Um, but the idea is is using a system as a way to kind of reanimate the absent Paris, other. London, you know? Berlin, all these so places. Here's, I really think that's uh, here's, here's Marina. She's getting her makeup world, done. Right Sometimes you'll see like a hand reach in and put the. Uh, put the makeup on, but so what you get, but what I what I was going for is kind of this surreal collage, you know, this disjunction. It's not you trying to be photorealistic, totally plausible. But you, know, you can go see the they're doing her lips, um, and, and you get this weird like mi you know cross editing of identity. Like whoever comes in front of it, you know, their body is just an occasion, like a chance for the system to to, to reanimate, to bring the presence of of these other people back into the room. So. So as an installation, you would come into a room and there would be maybe one or multiple of these monitors and you hear this kind of murmuring of voices and then as you turn to face any of these screens, you know, you, you, um, these kind of beings pop back into existence. Um, so again, you can kind of think about, I mean, think about the relationships between the self and the other and the, in this case, the viewer, you know, they're interacting with the image of themselves but with this other face edited on top, so. Um, but so, Moving forward, um, you know, shifting from, from machines that see, machines that hear, to things, machines that are actually doing, which is maybe the, you know, proper domain of robotics. Um, the, I've actually been working with uh, building a bunch of uh, drawing machines over the past couple of years, and this, part of this has to do with my history in drawing that, 
in painting that, uh, you know, I, I was like trained like very observational, you know, I like to go sketch and look at things in the world. But th there was this one thread in my drawing where I was kind of progressively trying to eliminate my hand more and more from that process. And it started with an interest in diagrammatic images, you know, so, so I would like go find these diagrams, like a gun disassembly diagram or something, you know, something I'm interested in, like a kind of a flow or a tool chain, and I would print that out and I would like look at it and sketch it as if I was sketching the world, you know. Um, Moving forward, at some point I started, you know, I, to kind of remove my, my eye from that process, I started tracing those images. And then these drawing machines are kind of another step where I'm also moving, removing my hand um, from the system. So this, uh, this project that was, this was down in South Lake Union last January, um, it's called Convex Mirror, um, and basically is a, is a camera uh, hooked up to a drawing machine, and I'll, sh I'll show you kind of what it does. Uh, but the Main reference for this was Parmigianino's self-portrait. I don't know if you, you all are maybe familiar with this image, but um, this idea, you know, that he, uh, you know, he sat down. He had like a, you know, a, a spherical mirror made. He had a piece of wood that was shaped in the same way, and he sat down, you know, studiously to copy all that he could see in the glass. And this is really interesting. It's kind of thinking about the labor and the attention to detail in him constructing this painting and capturing all of the distortions and all of the you know, strange effects of that, of that lens or that mirror. Um, so following along a similar line, uh, so I hooked up some basic image processing software and a camera to, to this mechatronic pin plotter. So you can see here's kind of an input image. Um, here's, you know, doing some basic like thresholding and edge detection. And then what we would have is this system would run it would take a photo, do a drawing, and keep doing this over some length of time. And what that produces is this layered image of place where, you'll see, where, um, you know, things that are moving are these transients, like these light, you know, traces, like in this case, in this storefront, you know, cars going by, people coming by. It might catch, on one frame, it might catch like one image or one profile. But over time, things that are fixed, things that are permanent, like the, um, you know, the building across the street, um, you know, these, these get darker. So, so you get this, there's this weird kind of precision, kind of not precision. There's a weird relation to, um, to human labor, I think, as far as like, I'd say like this is a much more patient, you know, much more patient at drawing than I could ever be, right? That you could, you can slow it down. You know, think about the scale of human labor and the scale of machine labor. You could slow, you know, this is, this is taking an hour to do one drawing and then it's drawing 12 hours a day over, you know, it was up for three months. Each, each drawing would take about uh, two weeks until it killed the pen. But, um, but yeah, so this, you know, so this, but so it's, it's doing a kind of labor, instead of, instead of like tracing images that exist, you know, it's producing this novel, this new view of the space in front of it as it saw it. And it's doing that, you know, through its work over time. So, um, so moving forward, actually returning returning to the ch to the children in some sense. Um, this uh, this project is called Searle's Room, and I, and I don't are people familiar? Have people heard of the Chinese Room paradox? It's this thing. It's kind of like a science fiction computer science thing, but about it's a thought experiment by by an American philosopher um, in the 80s about artificial intelligence. And the the thought experiment goes like this. So he says. Um, Excuse me. He says, uh, he says. So suppose you have a room. You have, you're writing down questions, and he's saying in, in like a Chinese script, you're writing down questions in Mandarin or something on a on sheets of paper and slipping them into this room. You don't know what's inside the room. It's just a black box. Um, inside the room, there's a man who can't read. That he just looks at the symbols. Then he has these books. He flips through the books. They tell him what to write down. He writes down his responses and passes them back out of the room. And the question is, is this, can you say this is like an intelligent system or not? Um, so uh, obviously the man inside doesn't know what he's reading. He doesn't know what he's writing. But to the viewer on the outside, it looks as if some meaningful exchange is taking place. Uh, this was a starting point for me. And I was thinking about the ideas of communication and language and what, you know, what, again, returning to kind of speech and language, but like what is, you know, what is communicable uh, through language? And so I settled on uh, children's speech and children's writing as these 
kind of like proto, you know, proto-linguistic, like almost but not quite words, almost but not quite writing. The system is like synthesizing new child babble live, um, and then it's trying to interpret it as speech, which is obviously not, not going to work. We haven't built our like baby speech recognition system, you know, or even like what is the you know what is the content of of those kinds of babbles, you know, devoid of the context of like the body. Uh, but this but this installation basically would have it has this circulation, this translation between speech speech and drawing, speech and writing, speech and writing. So system will talk, it'll listen to itself, and then this drawing will start, you know, adding new elements, also kind of sourced sourced from children's drawings to this ongoing, you know, image. Again, you know, here there's this kind of uh, more or less explicit, you know, uh, the robot is, is taking on this role of, it's like re-embodying the, you know, wherever the kids were that, you know, that I got those recordings from, or the, um, you know, the, the, the children who made these gestures, these drawings originally. So you can see, I actually, so on the, on the right is the drawing machine, kind of what I showed you with the convex mirror thing. Um, on the left is a, a similar system that's a drawing recorder. So. So basically, you just have two two encoders in the upper upper corner, and what you can do is, as as you trace over an image, it records this time series. So you can see, kind of the dark bits are where I'm actually pressing the pen down. The light bits are where it's kind of floating in space. And so the way I would enter data into this system is, I was collecting these children's drawings, and I would trace them into this machine, and the machine through that would kind of learn you know learn this language of of child kind of proto proto writing. So you'll see like this is a source image that I had kind of traced over. This is the robot like replicating that. Um, and you get these weird, I mean like the history of the history of painting, like abstract expressionism in America, you know, this idea of the gesture being all important with like Jackson Pollock. And here we're like capturing the gesture and you could replay it, you know, ad infinitum. You could have the same robot produce, you know, hundreds of this of this yeah, child drawing image. Um, and basically, yeah, we do like a little bit of, you know, you could kind of cluster the, cluster the points in time and space to, to produce like little segments of text that would go into producing the output image. So, um, just the, in the last two projects here, uh, briefly, this, this is maybe, you know, getting, getting back to robots a little bit, but this is the, this is the project that Mike McRae is in the audience. Hi, Mike. Uh, Mike McRae and I are doing for Black Box, so this is opening at the end of um, at the end of May. But the project's called Rover, and uh, for this we we this is this is kind of a this is like a are you guys familiar with light field photography? You know, there's this thing called the Lytro camera, uh, computational photography. This this way of like refocusing images after the fact or doing parallax moves and things like that. So we. Um, this is a project that uses some of those techniques, uh, but it was sort of modeled, it's called Rover, it was sort of modeled after the, uh, you know, Curiosity Rover, some of these, um, these systems that, as people, you know, we send out to these places we can't access and, and rely on this robot or this machine to create, to create an image or an understanding of this new, new terrain. So, we're using, it's a similar kind of, you know, stepper motors and CNC sort of control system that I've been using in my drawing machines, but instead of moving a pin around, we're moving a, a camera, you know, through space. Um, so you'll see this is out at Discovery Park with our little, you know, C stands and things, but basically, uh, you know, we have these motors that will step that camera through space in a pretty precise, everything I do is kind of like, should be precise, but it's not quite precise. <laughs> um, so you can see like this, in the ideal world, this would be like a perfect grid. Uh, these are the camera locations. But, um, you know, so we take, like this is, you know, over 40 minutes, the system will take 600 photos. So like 30 photos, like row by row. Over time also, so you get this, you get these time effects in terms of how you acquire it. Like if the sun, we're doing a lot of stuff in the evening, so the sun's going down or the lighting's changing. Um, 
this is a shot from inside my house, uh, but you'll see, so we're doing, so anyway, so the, the project is like, sorry, sending this robot out to explore these sites, and we're, and we're going for kind of like a dreamlike logic. We want to, we're doing some interiors and some exteriors. Um, and basically, we, so we take these 600 images, so you can see each one of these, you know, is kind of like this. Um, after the fact, so it's kind of like acquiring this data set, it's sampling much of the light that's like incident through a plane, through, you know, in these spaces. Um, after the fact, you can refocus and kind of move, move through these images. You'll see, here's our, our rover self-portrait. So I don't, I don't know if you can see in the middle there, you know, the system is pointed at this mirror, um, so it catches itself every time it moves by. And if you combine all 600 of those images, you can, you know, you can focus on rover or, you know, moving the focus kind of from, you know, from this flat mirror to this, you know, distant, distant shot. Um, in an outdoor scene, we'll see this. Sometimes it's called like synthetic aperture photography. So it's as if you're taking a photo with this, you know, lens that has a huge aperture to get this super narrow depth of field that you can manipulate after the fact. Um, so anyway, so this, this project, that's kind of the, the system. This project will be, um, our, our rover project will be in a shipping container in, uh, down at SIF uh, at the end of May. And what you'll see when you come in is you'll see a machine listening system and the refocuser, the thing that's playing with these images. These, you'll see the system kind of wrestling with these scenes that it's seen and trying to find, you know, finding points of interest and, and having some, you know, creating something that's kind of between you know, film, like a cinematic artifact, and you know, a photograph, which is a still image. So I think um, just <laughs> a preview, I won't go on about this, but um, kind of uh, synthesizing some of these threads of, of um, uh, you know, interacting, like constructing these closed loops interactions with machines, like using, you know, talking to the machine, um, having the machine, you know, look at me and assign me an identity. Um, my, so my dissertation project, which maybe will be sometime in the fall, uh, should be sometime in the fall, uh, is called The Machine for Living In. And I'm actually thinking about how all these projects have been most interesting when they're inhabited. Like they're interest, they, they become interesting through the person that's interacting with them um, and through, through the course of that interaction. So this project is focusing on uh, the home as a site the home and all the relationships and things that happen within the home. Um, this, this photo is from, uh, it's a Le, Le Corbusier building. Um, he, you know, he coined this phrase, the home is a machine for living in. But basically, I'm looking at kind of the, you know, maybe the dystopian aspects of the smart home. So maybe we probably need it. We do need the robotic, you know, the meld knob um, in, the, in the house. You know, to think about like what, um, you know, uh, first off, like what, you know, what, 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 what are we wanting from our, what are we asking for from our machines? You know, are we asking for, you know, is it like better living, optimizing, you know, the efficiency, energy consumption, optimizing your pleasure or your leisure? Um, then also just the fact, the basic fact that we, like we do inhabit our technologies now. That, I mean, that's like the state um, these days. So like inhabitation is our default mode in relation to technology. Um, so what, you know, how do we, how does that change how we understand ourselves and um, you know, how, how we understand these systems? So yeah, so just to, that's the last slide. Uh, this will turn into a project in the fall. But um, basically, I mean, like returning to the question of the robot and this idea of the robot as, as doing work, you know, the question is what, you know, what kind of work are we asking these systems to do? Like, can we, can we use you know, can we use some of these technologies like speech recognition or computer vision to, you know, learn something more about ourselves? Can we learn something about these systems that we are in fact inhabiting, you know? Um, and can we explore these, the limits and the capabilities and the shortcomings of, of these new technologies? So, anyway, thank you for listening. Yes.
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, actually, I, uh, I was thinking about these, the, well, I'm really interested in, so, you guys know about like social robots, this Cynthia Brazel, this person at MIT, you know, she does these like emotion, you know, robots that try to read our emotions. Um, I think there's, I think like as a lot of these um, kind of machine learning, computer vision type technologies get more sophisticated, you know, there's, there's this attempt, we're not just looking at like, you know, is a person in the room, we're trying to read these things that are like deeply human signals, you know, like, uh, so I heard something on NPR the other day about, uh, you know, profiling, it's, a, it's an iPad app that like profiles your emotions while you're watching TV or, you know, seeing an ad, like Doritos ads, I think. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think um, I've always, ha I mean, it, this, this connects to like my interest in, you know, like pa expressionistic painting and stuff, you know, that, that I, think, um, I think seeing some of these technologies like intercede and increasingly step into these domains of kind of human psychology, human relations is, is very interesting and is, is happening. Um, yeah, what, what direction, I, there just will be more. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a good futurist. Um, yeah, so I, th I just think it's. I mean, I guess the main thing I would say is just that I think it's. I think it's very important to use to work with these things in a self-critical way, like to try to think about. I'm not. You don't want to be like a luddite and say like, let's go smash all the computers. You know, you want you, like you like embrace the new, embrace the new technologies, but also um, keep a criticality about like what they're actually doing. You know, and what um, what are we? Yeah, what are we hoping for from them or asking? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. It's, my wife is laughing. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I mean, one, I mean, it's like at the beginning, you know. I was alluding to at the beginning, like, yeah, it's, it's kind of addictive, right, to get, I mean, these, you can go very deep in a lot of these. I mean, um, I do come from that kind of engineering and science background, so in some sense, I'm like, you know, I'm, com I'm comfortable doing that, but, but yeah, I mean, most, most of these projects, especially in the, since I've been in Seattle, these, the ones I was just showing you, um, many of those started with an interest in a technology. Like, I'm saying, like, speech recognition is a really, interesting way to interface with machines, you know, so that starts with the technical exploration and then you're like keeping your kind of ears open about, you know, th your senses up about like what, you know, how does this actually work, what's happening, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really nice working with Mike who's sitting next to you on this project um, together because cause he has all together different experience, you know, like an expertise with sound and, and all kinds of stuff that, um, it's, it's really nice to not, I mean, there's limits to how much you can do as a person, so you become this, like, kind of one, you don't want to be the one-man show all the time. But, so. Other questions? I don't know who to, yeah. Oh, sorry. I have a friend's son is here. <laughs> what? My favorite project? Uh, I am, I am going to love this project when it's done. <laughs> so, this is, this is my favorite, but it doesn't exist yet. So, is that fair? So you'll come see it, it'll be like a home or a room, it'll be this weird kind of science fiction home situation. So, okay, in the back. Um, yeah, that's a good, I keep looking at those like conferences, the human, you know, HCI conferences and, uh, what is it? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I think of, um, I think of these interfaces as ways to understand ourselves. I mean, I'm very human-centered, I guess, but, um, so I think, you know, you can think of them as kind of like mirrors or like, you know, like these, um, we build our human computer interfaces, right? So, um, one, you know, they're constructed by us, so they contain whatever values, implicit, you know, whatever we built into them. Um, and, yeah, they're everywhere. I mean, as we, I was thinking like one approach to this project is like, I'm just gonna put a little computing and everything in the house. You know, it's like you can get, you know, Arduinos and Spark cores and like all these, you know, different technologies. It's like, you can do that now, you know, so, um, so we encounter those interfaces in all, you know, multiple modes of being. Um, I don't know if that answers your question there.
Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's like a retro aesthetic going on with, especially with the 70s point of sale receipt printer, you know? <laughs> it's like, a, you know, as, a, as like a grad student in San Diego living near a surplus electronics store, you know, there's a little bit of that going on, but, um, but I think, but then I went and bought another dot matrix printer on, the, on eBay recently. So um, I think there's, I think one thing, uh, I think I think I like the uh, materiality of of that sort of a printer. You know, I think I like things that emphasize the you know physicality of these processes. I mean, it's like if you think about like e-waste. You know, it's like we're always like erasing the materiality of our devices and things. So, so definitely, if you use older stuff, you know, you it feels big and clunky, and it has all these. You know, it makes the sound and. Um, and then, and then otherwise, I just have, I mean, like, like the video of the Children Project, you could see that looked a little janky. Like there were some, you know, zip ties and things up there. Um, the one Mike and I are doing is like a little fancier, but um, I think I do have a very DIY sort of aesthetic. And part of that, as an artist, that comes also just from being a painter back in the day. And it's like, you just show up and you can paint on things and draw and that's fine, you know, as long as it works, so. I could. I mean, I've had I've had people contact me and said, yeah. So I, I, I'm not. I haven't like tried to like, you know, build a how-to or something. But send me an email. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I pieced that together. It, it basically I started those projects as kind of a side thing while I was working on other things that I thought were harder. You know, because it was like, oh, this is just kind of engineering. You know, I just need to like figure out how the motor works. You know, kind of busy work. Um, but a lot of that is pieced together from other examples online. Um, and then slowly as time, as I've gone through like revision nine and 10 of it, you know, it's, uh, it's become more of my own thing. But, yeah, yeah I, do, I, I do actually try to put um, resources up on, I'm not trying to like self promo here, but um, I do try to, I have like a wiki and I try to write up things when I do them um, through my website. So that's a good idea to put the drawing stuff up. More questions? Yes. Nice to meet you. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, question. I, when I in some of the like Q and A stuff before this event, um, I was thinking about my history with art and technology, and like for the longest time, uh, art was like very much painting, and I, you like go take physics class or like whatever you know whatever the engineering side was doing, and they were very divorced. And it's taken a long time, personally for me, to like integrate those in any way. And now I'd say it's pretty natural. Like the when I you know. 10 years into grad school, um, when I, you know, when I find myself in this program, like that's a digital arts and experimental media program, that's pretty natural. But um, I think, uh, I mean, I think the fact is that, you know, uh, when you, you can see it in like art departments around, you know, people, I mean, people are, I mean, we like produce with digital media so that, I mean, that is, that's a big part of culture and will only grow larger. Um, so I think, I think there's an interest in just there's that kind of a like a, a natural ground up interest in um, you know in people learning about and working with these art and technology things. Um, I think and then for myself, I just um, I you know if if I can get behind the scene, you know, instead of just like using the tool, if I can get in there and like make my own or monkey around with it. Like a lot of these techni techniques are the same, you know, like the image processing I'm doing, we're doing with this, um, or I was doing with the drawing machines is like the same as the filters you're running in Photoshop or something, you know, but like as far as getting behind the scenes and being able to work with like the meat or the material of the, you know, technology I think is a real, is, is very empowering. And I think 
yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think there's definitely more of that uh, in the future too. So. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Because it asks, it's more like what is human, like like our identities that you're kind of like going into this. I don't know something else about what is human about the human condition. Thank you. Yeah, I I mean I I I like that observation. I think um, I, I I'm always thinking about different ways to how to describe what I do, and I would say that like maybe I'm interested in like where, where technologies meet the, it's like the constituents of identity, right? It's like, it can be your face. I've also done stuff with like body tracking and motion tracking, you know, it's your face, it's your body, it's your voice, you know, um, these things that are, you know, maybe it's, maybe, maybe our identity is like in our relationships, you know, our social group or whatever, but. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think I'm helping anyone evolve, but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, but I mean, I think to, to, to re, to re-emphasize that, you know, re-emphasize these like basic markers or components of identity through technology, I think is, is really important. Um, it's like, and it's where, it's where this kind of stuff connects back up to like literature and painting and whatever that's been going on for like hundreds or thousands of years. And I'll stop there. <laughs> so thank you very much.